Hi, welcome back to the Lakeville Animal Hospital. I'm Dr. Dave Wolfthal, and today we're going to talk a little bit about traveling with your pet. Uh, it's summer. Well, I guess it's summer. It's June. Uh, in New England, in Lakeville, Massachusetts, the weather is gorgeous. And we're going to touch a little bit about air travel, uh, long distance staying places, shorter distances, and as you can see, car travel. So we're going to start with cars because that's where most of our travel goes. Is. So what do you need to worry about or think about when you drive with your pet? First of all, you need a pet. Looch, you want to come over here? This is Looch. Uh, Looch belongs to Denise. Looch travels with Denise quite a lot. Now they come to the hospital almost every day. So first step, you need a spot where you can have your dog comfortable in your car. Looch is in the back of the car. You can see the dog gate. One thing you don't want is your dog jumping into the front seat when you have a problem. You really don't want little guys jumping into the front seat either. Cats especially should always be in a carrier. Uh, there have been instances of cats roaming around and getting stuck under the accelerator pedal or the brake pedal or doing a tap dance on their, dog, on their owner's head, not a good idea. Now this is okay, but even better is to put Looch in a crate. Because if you decelerate, or God forbid there's an accident, he's going to get tossed around. This is an even Looch better setup. Looch, come on, right in the crate. This works very well. Smaller dogs, you can put crates side by side. He can't get in any trouble this way. Usually something like this is ideal. Now the other thing that we can do with Looch is they make all sorts of harnesses, straps, restraining devices. If your dog is going to be loose in the car, it's really a good idea to have him restrained in some way. I say him, obviously it could be a her. Um, Looch actually has a harness that he can wear when he sits on the seat and it straps directly to uh, the car seat. Okay, so this is going to take just a second while we put his harness on. Looch very often will travel with Denise. Uh, he often sits in the front seat and that's fine, but big, big, big but is turn the airbag off. This is just like putting a child in a child seat in the front. If that airbag goes off, it will do more damage than the accident will. Hi. Yes, you hate this attention, I know. Luch, how'd you like to get in the car again, except this time we're going to put you in the seat. Come on. Go with D. Okay, he just hopped right back up, right onto the seat. So basically, he's just stra it's not going around him, it's just his harness is now connected to the seat belt. So in case of, you know, sudden deceleration, uh, he's not going to go too far. So there's Looch in his car harness. They also make a lot of uh, harnesses that are designed to go in the back seat. They're almost like little baskets. Seatbelt goes through the harness, dog is sitting in the basket, very, very comfortable, very, very safe. There's a couple of things you don't want to do. Don't want to have your dog tied in the back of an open pickup. Uh, there have been way too many issues with that. In fact, at this point, uh, police can legally stop you and pull you over. Uh, we've seen dogs who've been uh, bounced around and have actually choked to death. Uh, while being restrained that way. If the dog has to be in the bed of a pickup truck, invest in a crate. Dog goes in the crate. Crate gets tied down at least two, preferably three points. Uh, otherwise, you will run the risk, and I'm not exaggerating, of killing your dog. And we've seen it. And it's just plain not worth the risk. So let's talk a little bit about car travel in general. You know, how do you know that your dog or your cat is going to be a good car traveler? Not all pets are. 
Well, the easiest way is going to be to take them on some short trips. Let's see how they do. Make it a nice experience. Uh, what I usually tell people is go in the car, sit in the driveway, don't go anywhere. You're just sitting in the car. Get them acclimated to being used to the car. After a few minutes, they come out, give them a cookie, give them a treat, pet them, tell them what good dogs they are. After a little while, you go a little further and you start the car. Again, you're not driving anywhere. Now you're just sitting in a car with the engine running. Yes, you will waste some gasoline. Sorry about that. But again, it gets the pets used to being in the car. Then you start with short trips. Now, some dogs are like some people. They will get car sick. There's very little you can do about really innate motion sickness. Um, don't feed them, definitely. Travel much better on an empty stomach. The other thing that if you find, no matter what you do, your dog will throw up. There is medication that can be given. It is not a sedative. It is designed specifically as anti-nausea, and it's quite effective. Uh, it's actually used for patients uh, undergoing chemotherapy, so it's pretty, pretty potent stuff. All it does is take away the nausea. It does not slow down the intestinal tract, does not sedate the pet. Should you travel with a sedated pet? The recommendation is no. Try not to do this. Um, giving them sedation can decrease their breathing, it makes them actually a little bit more prone. Are you trying to get out? You're hooked in. That's not really a good idea, young man. Uh, can you sit down again? Thank you. If, they're, uh, if you're giving them sedation, as I said, you'll end up with a dog that may have more trouble breathing, decreases their respiration, increases their risk of not being able to control their body temperature, Obviously, you don't necessarily want a dog who's lolling around looking like he's three sheets to the wind. Same is true for cats. Cats are actually a little bit more sensitive, uh, but the same procedures apply, get them used to going in a crate. So we talked a little bit about should you sedate? Not really recommended. Um, can you give your dog or your cat an anti-anxiety medication? if it's a really severe case. Yes, you can do that, because that usually doesn't sedate them. It just takes the edge of their anxiety off. However, this sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. And the only way you're gonna know that is, again, give it a trial run. Do this at home in a short trial at home before you go on a long trip. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about moving in the car what about where you're going? There are a lot of resources out there on pet-friendly places to go. One of the best is actually through AAA. If you're a AAA member, they have a lot of information on places that are pet-friendly. Resorts, hotels, motels. So if you're taking a car trip with your dog, you want to check one of these resources out. The AVMA, uh, I don't think has a list of places, but a lot of travel sites may have pet friendly listings. Be sure you know what they're talking about when they say they're pet friendly. Sometimes pet friendly just means, yep, we'll allow your pet in the place and we'll charge you $50 a night to clean up afterwards whether your pet makes a mess in that room or not. So be sure you know what they're talking about. Most facilities will charge for cleaning the room. Remember, the next person that's in there may have allergies and they've got to make sure they get all the dander up. Some places, uh, they'll put out welcome mats, doggy cookies, dog beds. Again, check your travel sites. What about identification? Pets do tend to run away, okay? If you have the ability to do so, microchip, wonderful. Uh, if God forbid the pet runs away, almost every facility nowadays, dog, Shelters, veterinarians have the ability to scan a microchip, determine who that dog belongs to. Just make sure that if you do microchip your dog, make sure you register the microchip, otherwise it's kind of useless. Identification tags, very good idea. Don't put your dog's name on the ID tag. I know that sounds counterintuitive, but 
if there's a question on is this dog your dog, somebody else's dog, they claim, oh no, I, it's my dog, and they actually stole the dog, it makes a big difference when you know how your dog responds to the name. If they don't know the name, they can't artificially make that dog respond. Cats, cats come when they feel like it, so I don't know if that makes a whole lot of difference. What about medications? Make sure you take along all your pet's medications. Some dogs require certain medications. Uh, there's no reason, for example, that a diabetic dog cannot travel along with you as long as you make sure you take all the appropriate medications with you. Uh, some dogs need thyroid medication, cats as well. Take some of your medication with you. Make sure you have enough for the whole time that you're there. Take some extra. You would be surprised how many times a tablet disappears. I've done it myself. Take a listing, if you can, of veterinarians in the area in case you have a problem. It doesn't happen often, but every now and then it does happen. We live in an area that's very close to resorts. Every summer we get somebody from the campground who calls up because their pet, dog or cat, has had a problem. Always good to know that there's a veterinarian somewhere nearby. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about plane travel. I know we're still in front of the car, but uh, I don't have a, a spare airplane to park in the back of the animal hospital. Plane travel is, as a rule, a bit more stressful for everybody involved, certainly nowadays. Number one, you have to have an approved crate or kennel. Uh, most of the crates are now line approved. You can get them at just about every single pet store, online, pet supply warehouse. Rules on crates, other than the fact that it has to be airline approved, has to be big enough for your pet to lie down and stand in, turn around, but when they stand, they're not touching the top of the crate. So there has to be enough room for normal stand, normal lying down. Number two, again, get them used to the crate. Make sure it has an adequate lock on it. You want to get to, this is the exact opposite of what everybody tells you to do. They tell you get to the airport early. You want to get there as late as you possibly can so your pet is not in the crate any longer than they have to be. Be sure that you know that you have all your paperwork. Most airlines have a requirement that you have to have a health certificate within a certain amount of time Every airline has different rules. Some say two weeks, some say 10 days. Used to be one set a month. You absolutely must check with your individual airline. Um, traveling with your pet in the cabin. Definitely check that part very early because most airlines will only allow a certain number of animals to fly in cabin. And it's usually one. So if you don't check in with that early enough, you just very well may be out of luck. If your pet is traveling and has to go cargo, in the summertime, you want to travel either early or late. In the wintertime, the exact opposite, you'd like to try and travel as close to midday as possible. Again, you're trying to avoid extremes in temperature. Hi, young man health certificates otherwise. If you're traveling interstate, you do need a health certificate. I'm going back to car for a minute because you do need to be able to prove that your pet is free of any infectious disease. You want to make absolutely sure that you've got all your paperwork because state police officers are allowed to pull you over and ask to see the paperwork. Uh, this is to prevent the interstate transmission of disease. Cats Again, they stress easy. You want to make sure that you get them used to their carrier. You want to get to the airport as late as you can and try and pick up your pets as early as you possibly can. Um, sedating cats, again, not a real great idea. Somebody asked me a while ago, uh, is there a difference with guys like Looch or guys like, I don't know if Tonka's around somewhere. We'll go find out if Tonka is here. Tonka is a bulldog. These dogs do have special problems when they travel, and the same is true of cats. 
the standard domestic short-haired cat versus the cat with the pushed-in face, the Himalayan. What the difference is, is here we've got Looch. Hi, your head's about that big. Tonka has this much anatomy, but he's got it in this much space. Everything is just pushed in. These guys have a lot of trouble breathing when they're stressed. So very important, make sure they're as relaxed as they possibly can be. Traveling with these guys in a stressful environment, uh, airport, I don't know how good an idea that often is. Certainly hot cars, I've, everybody's heard about this. The temperature in a car can rise dramatically in a very short period of time. These brachiocephalic dogs, dogs with the short pushed in face, cats with the short pushed in face, uh, are immensely stressed and have a lot of trouble with heat. So if you've got that issue, you really want to think seriously about looking for an alternative. Do you want to take that dog at all, look into a boarding facility, look into a pet sitter to take care of your dogs at home? Might not be a bad idea to take a look at possibly what some boarding facilities look like. So maybe we should do that next. Okay, this is Tonka. Tonka is, as you can see, an English Bulldog. He's a classic example of what we were talking about, the uh, short nose, this much anatomy, in this much space. So this is a guy who's going to have trouble breathing in really hot, humid weather. Be very, very, very careful in the car. Do not let these guys stay in the car by themselves. Uh, basically, period, end of story. You will cook the dog. Not good. We're going to talk a little bit about boarding. You might be able to see behind me um, the outdoor part of our indoor-outdoor runs. We talked about travel, going places. What if you really cannot travel or should not travel with your dog? The elderly dog, the ill dog, uh, the cat who is what we call a brittle diabetic. If they miss their insulin doses, uh, this is a problem. Stress will drive their blood sugar up and down. The dog who's on chemotherapy, the cat who's on chemotherapy, they really can't miss their medications. These are animals really that should stay home either with a pet sitter who can come to the house, medicate them, let them out. Again, we're talking different degrees of how ill these pets are. Or they should go to a boarding facility. Uh, behind me, you can see some of the uh, kennels that we have. Uh, we have both indoor and outdoor ability to keep animals. The kennels behind me are uh, the outdoor part of the indoor-outdoor kennels, so dogs can go outside. General rules on boarding. Number one, from the owner's point of view, you always want to be able to see where your pet is being kept. If for some reason uh, the facility will not allow you to see that area, you have to think about, do I want to go there? You want to possibly choose another facility. Now there are exceptions. We are primarily an animal hospital. So our primary purpose is to deal with animals that are ill. Secondarily, we board animals for our clients. So if we've got a procedure going on and everybody's tied up, there literally may not be anyone available to show you where your pet will be. To ask you to come back at a later time, a different time, that's perfectly reasonable. Um, but you definitely want to be able at some point to see where your pet is going to be. Next, is it clean? Obviously. Does it smell? Obviously. Uh, it shouldn't. If somebody just went to the bathroom right before you got there, yes, it will smell. But it shouldn't be on a regular basis. It should be immediately, somebody should be working to clean that up. Second, should you bring your own food? Most of the time, dogs and cats will do fine on hospital food. Uh, it's kind of like human hospital food. It's not terribly tasty, but it is nutritious. However, should you bring your own? Absolutely. I don't know of a facility that will say, no, don't bring your own food. If you want to bring your own food, if that's what your pet is used to eating, by all means, bring your own food, especially if your pet is on a special diet. Medications. If they're on medication, by all means, 
bring the medication. I don't know of a facility that will refuse to medicate your pet. Visiting, that's another issue. If you're you know, in and out, in and out, visiting isn't always a great idea. And the reason is you're here, your pet sees you. Oh great, mom and dad are here. This is wonderful, this is lovely. Hey, wait a minute. You guys are leaving and I'm not. Very often that can be stressful. So let's take a look at what these guys look like when they're in the run. Um, since Tonka's decided to take off, the inside part of the runs, of course, are air-conditioned. Um, during the day, as I said, these guillotine doors behind me are very often open. Depends on how hot it is. If it's really, really, really hot, um, we'd rather have the dogs inside where it's not so hot, especially guys like him. And they can then stay in the cool area. If it's really bad, we'll have them uh, stay inside most of the day. If it's not bad, nice beautiful day like today, they can go in and out as they please. It's not easy for the animals to escape. They, it, in fact, it's almost impossible, especially with the chain link on top, uh, the roof that's over the chain link. Uh, the doors are locked. There's actually a chain and lock on here. The doors also open only in one direction. If you've got, I'm going to lock myself in. This door will not go in the direction away from me. It only comes towards me. So if a dog is in here and they push like that, even if this was up, it will not go. They cannot get out by pushing the door this way. The only way it opens is inward. The same is true of the door that's leading to the walkway here. It only opens inward. So between the locks, and the one-way doors. Uh, escape is, uh, I'm going to sound like a World War II movie, escape is impossible. Nothing is impossible, but it's very, 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 very unlikely. Our capacity here for indoor-outdoor runs is 10, uh, five on this side, five on the other side. We have uh, indoor runs as well. They're not quite as spacious, uh, but that is usually used for animals who are large and are really only here for the day surgery cases, medical cases, although on occasion we will try and keep animals inside as much as possible when we're in the middle of a heat wave, which happens several times a summer. Um, it's always okay to bring things from home, but something to remember. Dogs can very often pee and poop on these things. Same with cats. So when you come to pick up your critters, don't be surprised if these things are in the wash because we don't know when they're going to decide to pee and poop on these things. So a lot of the times we will uh, have to wash them periodically while they're here. Timing, of course. Oh gee, you come on Monday to pick up your dog, towel's in the wash. Don't be surprised if you have to pick it up on a later time or a later day. Other things from home, uh, dog bones, stuffed animals, things like that. These are both yes and no. From the dog's point of view, it's wonderful, it's comfortable. From the boarding facility point of view, it's one more thing for us to lose. So if you can, be sure they're labeled very clearly. Be sure that whoever admits your pet knows that this product is coming along. Uh, the stuffed animal, the teddy bear, the, the favorite towel, even the dog bed. Uh, make sure that it's clearly marked in the record. We're happy to do so. And then we make sure when you go home that you've got everything. That's pretty much everything, I think. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to call us here at the Lakeville Animal Hospital, Lakeville, Massachusetts. Uh, our phone number is 508-947-1309. We're here Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. We're not here Sunday, so if you call on Sunday, phone, we'll go right to voicemail, you'll get called back again on the first thing we can do on Monday. Take care, everybody travel well. Hi, we're going to answer a, a mailbag question now. Uh, somebody asked, what do you feed your cat if they have a tendency to develop urinary issues? Well, number one is still one of the main things to help prevent urinary issues in cats is still canned food versus dry food. That's definitely the number one issue. If you can't do that, there are diets that are designed to help prevent uh, stone formation, crystal formation, which are the main causes of urinary issues. 
Most of the best ones, well not most, all of the best ones are veterinary only diets. So they're not diets you're going to find over the counter. Uh, the one that comes to mind the most is CD. It is made by Hills. It was designed, it's one of the first diets designed for cats with urinary problems. It comes both canned and dry. If you can't feed the can for whatever reason, you can try the dry. Uh, Royal Canin, another veterinary company, makes an excellent product, as does Imes. Uh, they also make urinary products, but remember these are prescription items. They're not going to be found over the counter. Okay, what about over the counter diets? They do have diets that are promoted as urinary diets. Um, in this case, you're actually going to have to look at the diet that's in the store. Uh, take, there's so many brand names out there, I can't even keep track of them anymore. Take a look at these diets, get their names, possibly talk to your doctor about each individual diet, and then they can give you the best recommendation on which dry diet to use. possibly talk to you.